big warm welcome to everybody on this lovely Friday, sunny Friday afternoon. It's really nice to see you all. Um, hopefully you do know me, but if you don't, my name is Pippa and I am the head of fundraising for the Delaware Pavilion. And I'm joined here today by my colleague, Dan, and together we look after the Delaware Pavilion members and patrons. Uh, we're really delighted to host this exclusive members and patrons event today, Carl Gent in conversation with Rosie Cooper. As many of you will know, Rosie is Delaware Pavilion's head of exhibitions and Carl is an artist, musician and writer from Bex Hill. Thank you both very much for joining us. Um, we also want to give a warm welcome to Holly Ferry, who is our wonderful BSL interpreter. And if you need to pin Holly, you can do using the dot, dot, dot function um, at the top of your window there. Before I hand over to Rosie and Carl, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so the talk will last for about 30 minutes, after which we'll have a Q&A session, which will be chaired by Dan. And we ask that you please keep yourselves on mute during the talk. Um, and you can ask questions either through the chat function on the bottom bar or um, after the talk, you can raise your hand and um, Dan will unmute you so you can ask a question verbally if you'd like. Uh, we also invite everybody to please put their pronouns in their Zoom name. Um, I'm sure you all know how to change your Zoom name, but if you don't, again, you can use the dot, dot, dot function at the top of your window and just click on rename. Um, after the session, Dan and I will be hanging around um, to say hello uh, or for anybody who wants to have a chat or ask some general DLWP questions. Uh, we'll be sending out a survey. <laughs> The event which we'd really appreciate you having a look at. Um, so without further ado I will hand over to Rosie and Carl. Thanks Pippa. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Sound okay? Yeah? Okay brilliant. Thanks everyone for coming uh, to join us. It's really lovely to be with you all and um, I'm really pleased to be um, in conversation with Carl Gent who I actually only who I met when I started at the Delaware Pavilion just about a couple of years after, I think probably in about 2018, um, when they sent me uh, an email out of nowhere, I didn't know them at all. And it was describing a project, which was about retelling the history of Bex Hill from a feminist perspective. And I get a lot of emails because many people want to show at the pavilion and want to know what we do and how they can get involved. And it's often that we just don't have space in our program to be able to platform artists work. But um, there was something about Carl's project that just really spoke to me and some of the interests that my team and I were engaging in at the time. So it was really wonderful to start a conversation with Carl, who's a Bexhill born artist, but who now lives in London. Uh, and ultimately to be able to include their work in our exhibition, Still I Rise, Feminism's Gender Resistance, that happened at the Pavilion in 2019. Um, and um, I remember when I was working in Liverpool Biennial um, about four years ago, talking to uh, a co-curator friend of mine, who is now a friend of mine called Raymondus Marischauskas, and he said that he thought that, of course, there's loads of ways in which you can evaluate the success of different projects along the lines of sort of money, how much press you get, all of this sort of thing. But he said that he thought another way of evaluating the success of projects was whether you make friendships through those projects. Um, so in that sense, uh, my work with Carl has our work together has been a real success because it's been lovely to keep in touch and to carry on supporting their work um, and to find ways of continuing a lot of those conversations that we began uh, during our work with Still I Rise. And it also feels really apt to be sharing Carl's work with you at this time when there are really big conversations happening globally about how we tell histories of place and people and what stories help us to understand who we are in the world that we live in. Um, and even though many of those conversations are massive and really monumental, they're also really within our own lives and the places that we're 
born in and the places that we get to know and the schools we go to and the people that we meet and it it's it's a conversation that's national and international but it also very local um because this is something that we're having to unravel everywhere you know who gets to tell the stories about the world that we live in and why and that's something that Carl's work is really addressing in addressing as you'll find out so as Pippa mentioned um much of their work is exploring alternative histories of Bex Hill and we'll be going into that um and so just in terms of the structure of the talk um I, we'll we'll be looking at some images of Carl's work um as we talk it will be mainly be Carl speaking I'll interrupt with a few questions and then there will be uh, time for you guys to ask questions at the end um, and I just wanted to mention you know we're really lucky to have Carl with us and they've presented their work um, at the Delaware Pavilion as you know also the ICA in London B22 Jupiter Woods Primary in Nottingham Wising in Cambridgeshire and they've got a show coming up at the new Flatland Project which is a great artist run space which is coming to Bexhill and Beeching Road opening later in the year so after that introduction, um, I will now pass over to Carl with a question that I have, um, which is growing up in Bexhill and now becoming an artist, if you could talk about what your experience was like of growing up in Bexhill and how that, you know, those first moments um, shaped your experience as an artist. Uh, thank you for a beautiful introduction, Rosie. That would, yeah, I'm trying to keep my emotions in check. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, happy to talk about Bexhill until the end of time. But I'm going to start. I'm going to immediately start sharing a kind of slideshow just because. Um, yeah, it'll it'll be more visually interesting. Um, so if you bear with me a second while I get that started. Oh, um, Dan, I'm not able to screen share for some reason. It might be something in the settings. But I'll start talking um, while that gets. Um, uh, changed. Um, yeah, so grew up in Bexhill, grew up, uh, born in 1985, so spent um, the, yeah, my childhood uh, living and growing up. And, you know, originally the place you're, you know, place you're from, it's just where you're from, you have no choice in that. But at some point in my kind of late childhood, um, let's try this now, here we go. Right, so, is that working? Can we all see this? Mm -hmm. Great. I never remember. Is this the one? Yeah, this is the one. So, um, yes, this is a picture of me watching the TV, and uh, so I lived kind of on the border of Sydney and Bexhill. Uh, just get let's get very specific here. Um, so that's a little me cute photo of me, and but it was something some point in kind of like late childhood or kind of early teens that I actually actively started enjoying uh, living in Bexhill, realizing kind of you know just to have access to the sea and how amazing that is, and. Um, as I grew up, kind of me and my, my friends, my kind of close, close friends, we started actively mythologizing Bexhill, like actively um, choosing to, to love it. Because I guess the, the obvious thing to do would be to go, oh, this is a dreary coastal post-tourist town. Um, but then it really became part of our mythology, just as something to do. And having the Delaware um, there, you kind of can't overstate the importance that has in a town, even if you, you know, if, even if you don't go there. And I guess for the first few years of my life, it was somewhere that I would just go and drink tea and look at the sea. Um, back when I was probably still a bit snobby about art, thinking it was maybe a pretentious activity or something. Um, but then actually having a space where you can see art and knowing that that's a thing to do. So, I mean, this is an image of a kind of pre-lottery uh, pre, pre -lottery funding kind of like, random show uh, called Maximum Cube by Heinrich and Palmer and I remember uh, a girl I was like obsessed with at the time I used to take her there and we'd sit on the floor this was kind of like a gangway with this kind of projected words that were kind of randomly generated with this mirrored floor so it was kind of an atmospheric space and it was definitely the first encounter with what you'd call installation art that um, I certainly would have had as a child uh, despite trips into London you know but they're they're more about trips to London than they are sitting with this piece, aren't they? So this was kind of, uh, this sticks out in my mind quite a bit. And then very early on as well, I remember um, was sitting in attendance. There was a concert in the kind of the space that's the kind of uh, restaurant space now. 
and it was uh, Baluji Sri the Stav, who's a kind of um, Indian, British Indian sitar player. So I remember this memory so well, it was kind of horrible drizzly weather outside and uh, Balu was there with a tablet player playing classical raga. The place was rammed with everyone drinking tea and kind of just like being there and several people were falling asleep. Um, such an iconic memory and at some point in that time I kind of asked my mum if I could uh, learn sitar kind of as a joke right but then she got me one and I started having lessons in Brighton and then I started and then me and my mates who I went to school with formed the band called Mumra who this was our first gig uh, at St Mary's school in uh, Pebsham and we did play at the Delaware a couple of times unfortunately I haven't been able to retrieve any photos of that because they're all in storage somewhere but um so again Bexhill and the Delaware became very pivotal in our kind of personal cosmology um so much so that like strangely so very unusually in 2005 uh this these artists Simon Green and Christopher Sperandad made this they were commissioned by East Sussex, um, I can't remember, name, some kind of council board to produce a comic that would be promoting East Sussex museums, convincing, I don't know, young people to get in there. And somehow they found out about us and they hung out with us a bit. And there's basically this comic book, which was, so this is us. And believe it or not, this, this crouching figure with a beard and long uh, blonde hair is me. I guess I looked quite different as a teenager. Um, yeah. Mom Mumra, the band. Yeah, yeah, Mumra is what they were called. So, yeah, this is kind of early growing up in Bex Hill, but then um, it was so linked to kind of um, the band and our life and community. So this was our community, our little kind of Bex Hillian cosmology uh, and the Delaware and the crazy golf course that used to be there was such a kind of like local, locally sighted uh, focal point of our lives, to be honest with you. And that and the big 24 hour Tesco, it was like, those were the three key, key places growing up. And yeah, and then uh, just due to normal reasons, kind of creative differences and girlfriends, I ended up leaving uh, the band um, um, and, the, and went to art school. Uh, that's what you do, isn't it? You stop doing music and you go and do art. And that strangely, they, that's when they kind of became, they got signed to a record deal. Um, so that, and then they became more uh, widely known. They were on the Wikipedia page for Bex Hill for a while. I'm not sure if they still are. I hope not, I'm not bitter or anything, but anyway. So um, yeah, that was interesting. Oh yeah, here's a, these are, this is a tour, but this is us in front of the Delaware. Anyway, so yeah, that was, that was growing up in Bex Hill early on. Um, and, and then going, going you know going to art school and taking art more seriously um and then the Dell Awards kind of program becoming more and more exciting and more and more kind of radical and interesting and better funded and like w was really important and seeing the kind of range of shows increasing and then just before literally the day before I went to do my master's at Goldsmiths um I was in Bex Hill seeing friends and this was the one day I had to uh, catch the um, Mark Leckie show, Universal Addressability of Dumb Things. I didn't really know much about Mark Leckie at the time, but I managed to kind of uh, catch this show um, before uh, running away to Italy for a couple of weeks and then going to Goldsmiths where I did my master's degree in fine art, where Mark happens to be one of the tutors there. And um, yeah, and his, his approach to making stuff was super important for sure. So yeah, a nice little kind of coincidence that I got to see that show in my hometown and then what that show said about materiality and cultural specificity I learned while at Goldsmiths and then towards the end of my time at Goldsmiths I ended up realizing that Bex Hill was a super important part of what I was going to make in the future. I think it's really interesting to hear you talk about how the Delaware Pavilion was somewhere that you could go and see things that you couldn't see any, anywhere else in the area so mm. there's an international program it's you know Mark Leckie's a leading artist it's there's you know there's a kind of variety of music and the visual arts which are presented there and just that being a really I mean I remember my the first exhibitions that really opened my eyes to what was possible for me as a cultural organizer and what artists were making, the breadth and sort of how you can fit in. And I think unless you see those things, it's hard to imagine them. So it's really nice to hear you talk about how the Delaware Pavilion played into that. 
mm-hmm. you will be one person. And that's becoming really an, a bit of an origin story that we've just heard now. Um, and I think, of course, there's the difference in, in your kind of work as an artist, there's been several origin stories that have played in. So of course, you know, what you describe is the same thing that many of us experience in our lives. You have this kind of early experience or a hometown experience that you feel a bit uncomfortable about or with, and then you go away to do something completely different. But then there's something about it that draws you back and that you want to understand better and work out. Um, And I just wonder if now would be a good moment to start talking about um, Kinefris and your origin your own origin story and how that took you to the origin story of Bex Hill and of Kinefris. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um so well, you know, like uh you know, at art college and working out how to make art, which is a really hard thing to work out how to make. I guess a lot of my questions were quite formal. They were like working out how to kind of um make uh tr- I don't know, how to make work ecologically, how to make work porous and so on and so forth. And I think at some point I realized I was still treating myself as a kind of uh universal subject and then realizing that's that's wrong that's weird just because I'm like white English etc etc there's I'm specific you know so at the time I was doing this strange bunch of research where I was looking at this uh, phenomenon called pseudo-cuthic which is I'm just going to kind of talk about the project in a kind of chronological way because that's kind of the only way it makes sense to me um so pseudo-cuthic was is a kind of just a little kind of art world phenomena where in the kind of medieval times you'd get kind of western european painters using a script that was like kind of they couldn't read arabic but they would use script that looked like arabic because on on like and here we have uh, giotto uh, madonna and child and this this around around the hem of her kind of robe this is giotto's attempt at arabic in his mind arabic is, that's a language from the middle east the Middle East is where Jesus and Mary come from, so that makes sense. Uh, obviously, kind of like pr- maybe pre kind of a, a wide understand kind of allergy between Islam and Christianity. So I was looking at these and trying to work out, I don't know, looking at that those interesting elements in it. And then in that period of research, came across um, these coins. So um, the top coin, you've got the kind of reverse and face of it is a Abbasid dinar kind of from like the eighth century. Um, yeah, used by the caliphate at the time. And the bottom is a coin called the offer coin. So there's one of these, it's tiny, it's like smaller than a five pence piece. And it's, in, it's normally in the British Museum. And it's, uh, and you'll see the kind of bottom left hand uh, side, it says offer Rex, which is King Offer. Um, now I knew the name King Offer because I went to King Offer Junior School. Um, in in Bexhill, this is my and you know you've got off the way the the road that cuts you know the bypass that goes to the old bypass that goes to um Bexhill uh, to Hastings, so already there was this kind of grain of like oh I know that how strange that I have come to King Offer via this completely unrelated branch of research, and this coin, the uh, Arabic the kind of copied Arabic is upside down to the Latin, so the the guy who minted it clearly couldn't read Arabic. So, you know, there's lots of kind of funny kind of uh, discourse about what this coin was. Chances are it was just um, they used it to trade with the caliphate at the time. Fine. You know, interesting. Amazing. Um, but then, like, the research led to King Offer, and I was like, I know so little about King Offer, despite going to King Offer school. This is cute little me in my King Offer school uniform. Um, yeah, in, in one of those amazing photos. So carrying on the research I was, I was like why do I know so little about King Offer I went to a school and got him and as I was reading about him I kind of became more interested with his wife Kinnithrith Queen Kinnithrith Queen of the Mercians at the time um here's a picture of Queen Kinnithrith and so she was an incredibly powerful woman she was Queen of Mercia Mercia um, being the kind of Midlands kingdom of England at the time so Bexhill Hastings not part of Mercia but Mercia was very uh, aggressive, uh, militaristically aggressive. So in, um, I, can't remember, I think, seven, 782, not sure, um, King Offa defeated the people of Hastings, uh, is how it's um, described, and then said, build a church here. And that church is St. Peter's Church in the old town of Bexhill, and this is the birth of Bexhill. Um, hence his name kind of being littered around the town. So 
was learning about Kenithrith, she was like, seemed kind of to have almost equal power um, with King Offa. At the time, her face is the only face on a coin in uh, a woman's face on a coin in Europe at the time. She was kind of countersigning legal documents as letters between her and the Pope. You know, she's huge. She's the most important woman in Europe at the time. And I know nothing of her. I've heard nothing of her. You know, like, I, you know, I've heard of King Offa, you know, quite a lot growing up in one of his towns, but nothing of Kenithrith. And then and they the king of the way but no queen Kenneth of way no not yet next bypass they build it'll be yeah. Kenneth of way next bypass um but yeah so i just wanted to learn about her origin story and this is kind of this is her she's she was a frankish noble who was cast out to sea because of some um rumored kind of um yeah yeah she wouldn't sleep with Charlemagne or one of Charlemagne's relatives, so they put her out to the sea and she washed up on the shores of Wales and then ends up marrying King Offa. So there's already kind of a complicated kind of origin story with her. And I'll, yeah, I could go on forever and ever about the historical interesting things about um, uh, Offa and Kenithrith, but um, that was like a three hour talk, so I'll, I'll skip over it a little bit. Suffice to say, um, her story, she was the most important woman in Europe at the time, but her story was severely overwritten by uh, her later biographers, like kind of 300 years later, um, which in this manuscript called The Lives of the Two Offers, and, that, and all the kind of existing images we have of Kenithrith are from this, this manuscript. Um, so that's the start of it. But I found, I was like, okay, her story has been overwritten. How can I, how can I? intervene or how can I help how can I try and re imagine her biography um in a more positive feminist kind of corrective way against these violences done against her name and how can I do that through art um so I guess this was the first piece I tried to make um and I have done a lot of writing about Kenithrith but I think I think I've, I've really tried to steer away from it because it's writing that that did her that is the source of the injustice against her history and and despite the writing saying she committed all these crimes that she did not commit, I still feel some kind of kinship with her story and that must be I don't know that's through materiality that's through um, through a sense of place. So I was like, okay, it's is the materiality that's kind of helping me connect to her here. So how do I make work? about Kenithrith. So this was the first piece. This, this was literally a kind of soap carving. So this is one of those shaving soaps. Quite, I, I think it was quite a high quality one, but it was very old, so it had gone quite nasty. And, um, and I just tried to carve a, an image of the coin bearing her face. So even though this is quite a, it was quite a masculine rendition, it was it's Kenithrith on, on, the, uh, on the coin. And during doing this soap carving, soap became a very kind of central material in the process and there's something about it there's something that seemed to kind of crudely resemble what i was trying to do like trying to clean history but then you try and clean it and uh, actually what you just get is you cover it up with a layer of soap so it seemed to kind of like all these men that have later you know been involved in later telling her story for their own ideology of which you know i'm trying to not do the same thing but maybe i am soap became quite interesting and important um and then yeah, just try for, at the start of the project, just try to assemble a range of materials that I would trust to, to convey her story as well as possible. So soap was one of them. I started using kind of, um, yeah, King off a school uniform. Uh, so this is a book bag that I kind of filled with a uh, daub. And um, this is a painting. I did I never paint, but this is a painting I did. So this and is that, a scrap. Mm. I just wanted to mention that, that this sort of, accumulation or constellation of different materials that you're using you call it vexillian materiality mm. and just mentioning door i really love the way when you said um ar around the time we were working on still i rise you were talking about door which is this very ancient material made of uh clay and sort of straw and you know things like that is also a material that's used of in eco homes of the future mm. yeah so there is this sense of sort of materials that transmit different layers of time and history and past and future to them as well yeah absolutely so like daub is a material i really trust and um 
obviously it kind of has this resonance of kind of ancient housing and it's built it's literally comprised of whatever the locally available soils and animal dongs are and stuff but so, but it's as you say it's kind of more and more popular for making ecologically sound housing um so it's got this slippery materiality to it and so much of this project i think i used to think that history was fixed i used to not be so interested in the past because i was like well it happened what can change but so much about this project has been learning about and no, it's the story needs is told again and again and again and again. And it's how it's told. So this kind of like even this painting, I mean, this is a kind of like rendition of Knithrith looking sad, having a shower. Obviously, there were no showers in the eighth century. Um or gaffer tape or school uniform. But um yeah, that's been kind of super important to not try and uh, fall into a space of um, what's the phrase reenactment I'm not reenacting the 8th century or 7th century it's it's in, it's it's bringing it's smushing the now and the then together and seeing what can be shared um, from each other um, yeah so there's some more and one of the yeah and like again not wanting to trust my own voice too much because um, what do I know necessarily there's been a lot of collaboration as the project's gone on so this was the first kind of collaborative work I did um, was talking about English folk music uh, with um, Harva, my friend here, um, and a very good artist. Um, and they taught me about, she taught me about like, yeah, English folk and how it was kind of um, crude, low cultural format and a, a format that could slip, maybe slip some kind of truth that wouldn't get edited because it's folk music and who, who would, who, yeah, the, the powers that be wouldn't edit it. Um, so we kind of like tweaked a folk song to try and maybe fit Conithra's narrative a little bit, um, which was really fun. And I think, you know, Sussex is a big kind of English, you've got Sussex and you've got East Anglia, they're the two kind of core regions of, of folk, so that was super fun. I'll try and play a little bit, so this was like, I don't know if this will come out. We can't hear anything. Oh, never mind. Okay, never mind. Um, but, I think really, but I think it's, I mean, what you're talking about is folk music as a form of oral history. Mm. Yep. And something which is informal and just sort of understanding that those different layers of history and storytelling are just as valuable as the, as the, um, as the sort of received official history. Yeah. It's a name we can't hear part of the music but maybe we can figure out the settings to play at the very end as a sort of I'll try oh i think i've worked out her hang on oh, okay maybe this will work so just to contextualize so this is a song that me harva and uh, max harva's friend knew through shirley collins's version shirley collins from hastings uh it's called the original well the version we knew was called i uh, i drew my ship and then we kind of just I was really gung-ho I tried to stick in extra verses and they were like that's not how it works you've got to kind of collaborate with the form and the song and the history and just tweak it to make it kind of tessellate with what you want to say and um, so they taught me so much about this uh, let's see if it works is that working the golden shores where I am bound, they drew my ship out of the harbor, they drew it far from my home away, they drew me close to the cold white water, for he would not let me stay. I'll do. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that was that was an important lesson to learn for sure. Yeah. Um, so what were we talking about? Vexillian like materiality. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah. So then, bringing in other people and collaborating and and making sure there was a like a range of voices in the projects was super important. And trying to use the process of making the art or projects or performances to to learn things about Gnithrith, making it more like a learning tool than, than a you know bunch of objects that I'm making was super important. So this is a terribly, terrible quality image. So this is another image from the manuscript about Offer and Gnithrith, where you've got King Offer in the middle um, with St Albans Cathedral, which he said he'd make uh, in his lap, and these two monks either side 
writing his history and his scrolls. So I, I using my you know, very crude skills, I uh, inverted the church, the uh, monastery, and designed a kind of, I turned it into a kind of cesspit. Uh, so this was an, a work that I made for this show called Our House of Common Weeds, at Rares in London. And it was effectively a kind of inverted sculpture of the cathedral made of daub um, and filled with uh, water that had these two printers um, that were mobile connected. Um, so oh, yeah, whenever the exhibition was open, I would just randomly send them documents from my phone to do with Knithrith, to do with other related kind of inputs uh, that would then spit into the uh, water. Uh, and that, you know, there were also kind of uh, repli replications of the coins made of, uh, these are made of aluminium and we've kind of got wig hair, pink wig hair here, and we've got fuchsia flowers. Fuchsia flowers became quite important to the project as part of my kind of Bexhillian materiality, partially because you get a lot of them in Bexhill, um, any kind of coastal town, I guess, but also the fact they're upside down, this, this thing of being upside down became like the pestle is facing the ground, that became quite important. Um, I think about it being important because facing the ground and working sort of ground up and mm. grassroots as it were is how where you felt some of the action needed to be in terms of kind of retelling those histories and addressing those histories. So yeah. you're looking really you're looking down at the grassroots histories and at the things like the folk songs that have been passed down from generations over hundreds of years, you're looking there rather than the sort of official histories that became a sort of, that's a metaphor essentially. Yeah, definitely, you, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and yeah, you, you know, hanged man, pittura, infamante, all these kind of like ancient practices of turning things upside down in order to learn, in order to see a new perspective, yeah, yeah really important. And yeah. that sort of liveness, I'm just looking at the time as well. Yeah, but yeah liveness and the fact that your sculptures and your works are always active and being activated mm. nothing fixed in them when you make a sculpture it's not it doesn't go on a pedestal and then that's it it's continually activated whether it's uh the documents flowing into the water whether it's collaborating with people to make a performance mm. you know, they're not they're not fixed and there's something which is not precious about them to you and I think that's important again in terms of looking at the histories which are not fixed and I just wonder if we could skip through a few of the yeah, images absolutely. And, so let's, uh, and just uh, this is such a great image though isn't it I'll With talk super yes yeah, let's, yeah. let's, I'll do so this super quickly so uh, I made a carnival float for Kenithrith that was part of the 2018 I guess um carnival yeah back so carnival so this was super fun we were making daub printing things out had flags went through the town etc etc um which was great and then remade that float in an exhibition in london uh, a year or so later um so yes uh then contacted rosie at some point knew the work needed to return to bexhill emailed both rosie and julian at bexhill museum uh saying hey i've been working on this project for a couple of years i've started to kind of really um get invested in bexhill uh i'd learned about Kate Marsden so I'm sure many people here know the story of Kate Marsden but to those who don't very quickly she was a kind of Victorian missionary nurse who um, traveled to Siberia in search of a curse this is her in her incredible legendary Siberian get-up uh, traveled to Siberia in order to try and find a cure for leprosy uh, she didn't find a cure for leprosy but she did uh, forge create a leprosarium in like a leprosy hospital uh, in uh, Eastern Siberia. So, and then came back to, came back to the UK, suffered a smear campaign. Um, there was lots of kind of questions of how she dealt with money. Um, she was gay. There was lots of kind of slander about her kind of sexuality as well. Anyway, later in life moved to Bexhill for, was one of the founders of Bexhill Museum. So, um, um, yeah, cold calling, sending emails to galleries. Who does that? Only mad people, but I did it and it worked. Hallelujah. Um, I'm really glad because if this show had happened and I hadn't been in it, I would have just, yeah, been mortified. I uh, would not have been able to enjoy seeing the show. Um, so I met Rosie and, um, and Julian and uh, started talking about uh, the work and the project. 
And uh, Rosie was in the early stages of, well, was kind of had started planning the Still O, Still o Rise series of exhibitions um, with colleagues in Nottingham. And um, yeah, kind of just, yeah, talked about shows, talked about the options and really used the opportunity to focus on Kate Marsden. So Kate Marsden, yeah, she was the founder of Bexham Museum, but due to the kind of slander, the smear campaign around her name, her, her name, which, yeah, she was forced, forcibly removed as being the founder um so her co-founder who i forget the name of uh not not just not just tactically i have forgotten the name of him um his portrait hangs in the in Bexham museum his painted portrait and then uh, f uh after her death um a friend uh live-in friend of kate marston went to the museum with a photographic portrait of kate marston saying hey would you like this and they refused it uh, anyway, I was talking to Julian about this and Julian showed me something which I must have seen dozens of times growing up, but I never noticed, where the plaque on um, the other, the co-founder's name, uh, where it says its founder, someone scratched out the phrase its founder, probably um, Emily Norris. Anyway, so um, I was working... Not being Kate Marston friend. Kate Marston, yes, exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was trying to work out how to make work for this incredible exhibition. I was quite intimidated by the whole uh, situation because this was a dream come true, you know, like to show in the gallery I grew up with, still can't believe it happened, uh, I'll stop gushing. But um, so I ended up kind of making a, a kind of two portraits basically. So this kind of mound, uh, this, this was intended as a statue of Kate Marsden made of daub. And um, the cracks in it are sealed with, um, Christmas pudding. Christmas pudding was part of uh, the rations that Kate Marsden took to Siberia with her. No idea why. Um, and fuchsia. And and... A little fuchsia in there as well, isn't there? Yeah, so you got a little yeah. fuchsia. That there was some coal dust as well. Um, and then you, and then there was a receipt printer that kind of printed out this kind of uh, collapse of various kind of excerpts from the various women um, related to um, Kinnithrith that I was looking at. And uh, and then got my friend who can paint, James Argyle, who was the guitarist in Mumra. He's a much better kind of um, painter than I am. So he painted a oil painting replica of um, the one, the the portrait that um, was rejected uh, after Kate Marsden's death in the 30s. Uh, so yeah, and use this as a literal opportunity to have this portrait of Kate Marsden in a Bexhill cultural institution, some kind of corrective kind of work. Um, at the clip so yep that was great at the and um the whole sculpture was on wheels again because I, I i don't yeah i don't yeah well i mean there's several reasons why um yeah i could talk about these to the museum yeah so then at the close of the exhibition we wheeled it from the delaware the weather wasn't too bad fortunately um and it's a short journey to the museum and uh and the museum graciously accepted it so i donated it to the museum and it's now hanging we had this is julian uh, there was a, there was this incredible event where um so kate marsden's worshipped in siberia despite her kind of uh fair anonymity in england so some researchers came over filmmakers came over and we had this kind of unveiling ceremony uh so yeah now she's there at the entrance of the museum um and here's uh, Jackie Hill Murphy, who's another Kate Marsden kind of researcher, Julian and the film crew from Yakutia uh, at the unveiling. So yeah, that was a kind of remarkable kind of um, moment where this project seemed to cease being art and became more like, I don't know, his historiography, I guess. Um, There's you know, everywhere in it. I mean, things that come, and I think this is one of the things about your practice and a lot of artists practice that maybe isn't talked about in the mainstream enough that there are this is what your work is dealing with as well that there are tendrils that go out into the world mm. and that come back in you know your work is part of the world it's part of history it's storytelling it's all of these things so for some of it to go back into the museum seems completely right I mean in a way that that um sculpture the daub sculpture is like a vessel for this action it's the sort of this is you know so there's lots of different versions of the work and Definitely. this is this is the Bexhill Observer this is the Bexhill Observer I made it yeah. after 35 <laughs> years I got in there 
Hallelujah. Um, yeah, so that was a magic time. There was also like other assaulted events that occurred when the Siberians were here. They reconsecrated her grave, which is in Hillingdon. So there's the kind of Russian Orthodox Bishop of London there, got to go to a pizza party with him, which was bizarre, you know, um, remarkable. Um, and made a lot of friends who I'm still in touch with in Yakutia. So maybe hopefully one day I can go and visit uh, Sakha Republic um, and where there's statues to her and everything. Um, yeah, and that's kind of, I mean, that's enough. Uh, so in terms of like where we're at now, the pro uh, kind of, yeah, I've been concentrating on a couple of other projects. The folk music interest has budded off into another project, interestingly. But um, this year, when when things reopen again, got a couple of exhibitions, one at Jupiter Woods and one in London, in Southeast London, and one at Flatland Projects um, in Beeching Road, where I used to work in the embroidery factory um, as a teenager. Um, and these, this is going to kind of, yeah, kind of coalesce a lot of the work, um, which is super interesting. Um, and yeah, a chance to kind of make work in Bexhill again in a new space, which is interesting, you know, a new, a new gallery. And that'll be a very different experience, I'm sure. Mm. And we've been talking about the work. I mean, I think now would be a great moment to take questions, but mm. we've that thing of the work going into the world and then the world coming into the work and those things being the same that porosity have been, has been something that we've been talking about as well and I think it will be really wonderful to see all of this body of work and thinking come together in Bexhill yeah hopefully um, in autumn I believe I think, I think autumn yeah 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 I mean everything's a little let's see at the moment but yeah no autumn Thank so much for sharing Thank with you. us. Real pleasure to hear everything. And um, Dan, I don't know if you have any questions that you'd like to ask. Yeah, so I've had a couple of questions messaged to me privately. Um, and if anybody else would like to ask a question directly, please do feel free to put it in the chat or to raise your hand and I can unmute you if you wish to ask Carl directly. Um, so something that was asked in the chat is you said that you mythologized Bex Hill as a child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did you find that that's something that other artists or other people you've collaborated with also did either outside of Bex Hill? Um, so for example, at UCA, did you find this is a common thing that people have done to reimagine where they grew up? I don't, it's a strange one, isn't it? I think we all have a, I don't know. It's, it's, I think we did it, we felt so rebellious. Like when we were at high school, you know, saying we liked Bex Hill was a weird thing to do. You know, I think this is our version of being punk uh, as teenagers anyway. Uh, and like, we didn't start drinking until quite late in life. We were obsessed with tea and Bex Hill. Those are the two things we were obsessed with. And folk music, which back then, this was pre Mumford and Sons, you know, no one liked folk music then. Um, no teenagers anyway so but that thing at some point and often you have to go you have to move away to kind of um see home don't you to kind of contextualize home otherwise because it's your universe when you're growing up you know so you have to go to other places in order to think of think of to properly figure it um so i guess there's two things that you, it was it was definitely a willful assertion a kind of semi-sarcastic one at that but um I don't know. It's a tricky one. And I, th I, I, I don't know. I can't, th I think it's something that I saw put on a lot of my friends at art school who were from other countries or from other backgrounds, you know, they would be expected or not expected, but like, um, they were like, Oh, this is obviously about your background. And it wasn't asked of like, um, uh, me or or like uh, or other white English friends and I guess part of this project has been about going what's that about and and it started before the Brexit vote this project so it's been very strange to kind of go through this project that's kind of about England in a way during the past five years when things have yeah a lot's been about England over the past five years in the world so yeah that's been interesting I haven't really answered the question I apologize no, it's interesting to hear the contrast between how you were sort of treated and the expectations on you as an artist from mm. more outside of London um, and those yeah. who had come from Europe or perhaps around the world. 
Yeah. Another anonymous question I had was after Sinephorus and Kate Marston, is there anybody else who you're looking to rehabilitate or explore their story of? Uh, good question. Um, there's other, there's kind of other kind of quasi mythical figures who've, so going to Kate Marsden, because there was a, there's, there's been about finding someone who had a parallel kind of, or had shared things with Kenithrith, um, and trying to kind of use Kate Marsden to help Kenithrith and vice versa. And then there was also kind of a few other kind of, um, like literary, for lack of a better word, interpretations of Kenithrith. So she's mentioned in Beowulf, that kind of, um, HBO History Channel Vikings series had a character called Quenthrith. Um, yeah. There's been uh, self-published ebooks, uh, author called Jane Stone. She kind of makes these kind of um, strong female kind of biography uh, ebook novels. There's one on Quenthrith, and that's interesting. And in each of these, you see the kind of ideology of the author kind of being embodied. Um, like. I think what it's taught me, I don't know, because it's, it's a strange one, because Kenithrith, you know, she was like a rich queen. Uh, like, why am I writing a story about a rich English, you know, work, making work about this? Um, and at the, I've really found it difficult to kind of intervene too much in her story. I found it quite easy to kind of tell the story of the men that surrounded her or kind of um, at, attacked her. But I think what it's taught me is is the importance of storytelling, and that's kind of how and how that is that that is a kind of a, a, a healthy mode of making. So I think this is where the kind of folk music um, project that I'm working with Kalichi and Nietzsche has uh, has budded off from. It's kind of focusing on the formal qualities of, of folk music and, and storytelling. Yeah, but I'm still just I'm still just Kenneth obsessed. It's still just it's probably going to be Kenneth Rith for. 50 years, you know, have a ta have a tattooed on me at some point, oh God knows. I mean, I'll probably change my name to Kenneth if he knows anything, anything. So has anybody else got a question that they'd like to ask directly? You are welcome to unmute yourself if you so want to. Um, if I think not- Sally uh, Hemmings has got a question. I'm just seeing a waving hand right there. Let me find Sally. Okay, Sally, I've asked you to unmute yourself. Great, thank you very much, Carl. It's a question kind of along those lines um, of um, hidden histories. We've been done, involved with Beckdom Museum and we do a lot of oral histories, so we interview people about their experiences of living and growing up in Bexhill. And I'm just wondering if you can think of any hidden histories that you think should be explored from Dexo itself, or whether there are groups of people that you think, you know, they, their story really isn't being told, as, as your Dexo grew up probably with my kids, because they all used to listen to Mumra as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amazing. Um, I mean, I think as anyone who's lived in Dexo knows, there's thousands of, uh, yeah like stories and histories you just have to talk to anyone in town and uh which you might not want to do but like you know like if you talk to anyone in town you'll get you'll get more stories than you'd maybe asked for but um it's yeah it's uh it's kind of incredible and and it's kind of ever-changing and even like meeting Ro rosie her when i first met rosie and we were talking she told me I didn't, I wasn't really aware of the, um, the Alistair Crowley stuff until Rosie told me and meeting Julian, like his wealth of knowledge, uh, like, which is boundless of, of, of all the, of the various things that happened at Bexhill. Even recently, um, a friend of mine was sharing the story of the, um, that's, that was, that was in the Guardian recently, the, the terrible, the, the kind of laundry situation, which I was obliquely aware of growing up. Um, but yeah, in that kind of hushed tone way that these things are kind of mentioned. So I think I think it's as as me and Rosie were kind as Rosie was kind of saying at the front, it's that intelligence of kind of like um, emotional intelligence of just going, hey, let's stop, let's look at this place, let's understand, let's try and understand this place. This is never gonna kind of it will never end the tr the attempt to understand this place. But there's so many. Um, folds of story. I mean, even the kind of, even 
you could just talk about Eddie Izzard for a long time, couldn't you? You could talk about anyone for a long, long time and how and how enmeshed these histories are. Mm. And I think even just, you know, when I arrived at the Delaware Pavilion as well, there were so many different, you know, there's a straightforward story and then there's a really complicated mm. story. And I'm always drawn to the more complicated story because it includes more people and more histories and more things. So the El Della War, his mother was the head of the suffrage um, uh, group in St. Leonard's and his grandmother had a floating museum. And just looking, I mean, when I started, we did an exhibition called 1935 in the rooftop foyer, which was about different events that, that had happened in 1935 within a 30 mile radius. And just looking at that, you see, and there is the cobbler, the psychic healer cobbler who, who lived in Bexhill, who published yeah. his autobiography in that year as well. And just looking at all the, all the sort of multiple narratives at play, which always, you know, how much you know often depends on whose voice is the loudest, who gets to speak and why, all of these things. And I think as soon as you start kind of lifting the lid, there's just so much. And it's often the most, in my opinion, the most interesting stuff because we don't know it because it, and then it shows us more about society and who we are. Mm. I don't know if we've got another time for a question, but there's a question, so, there's a couple of questions coming through in the chat as well. I saw those, yeah, so varied. Um, yeah. In terms of like, uh, yeah, in terms of, uh, Kenneth, Queen Kenneth and King Offer, the histories are there. You can go to Wikipedia. There's there's a kind of, which gives you a basic rundown. There's, there's a really good book uh, by Michael Swanson called The Lives of the Two Offers. So this is the first kind of history book I've read and it's kind of magical, uh, very beautiful book. Um, not so available online, but I really think that like part of uh, the work I'll be doing for Flatlands and Jupiter was later this year will be to have a uh, place where, this, these histories can be kind of seen, this story, let's call it a story, that's a better word, isn't it, um, can be found more readily. It's, yeah, it's kind of interesting, and as Rosie was saying, like, kind of not interested in making any of, of my uh, tweaks into the Kniffis story canonical, because as soon as they're a blue plaque, they kind of, they get fixed in time a little bit and they lose, they lose the thing, whereas if it's more like folk music, if it's a tradition that it's already passed on, it survives in a more lively way and maybe some things fall off the vine on the way, um, but that's fine. And then I saw, sorry, I'd, yeah, so, but I'll, I'll pop some links, uh, I'll get I'll get some links, some good resources about offering Knithrith and send them over for sure. And um, Christina, uh, oh, you're at UCA, are you at Farnham? I wanna know, that's where I did my BA. Um, and you're from Bex Hill, amazing. Um, what kind of direction do I feel my practice will take in the light of COVID's effect on Bex Hill? Well, because of COVID, I haven't been able to go to Bex Hill for a year, which is killing me. I miss it so much because um, I'm in London now because I work here. But um, in terms of, it has changed how we make work. Um, it's changed, I think there's gonna be a real hunger for, material exhibitions but I think there's always there's also gonna be a heightened awareness that when we go to an ex like an art thing or a, or a talk or a performance if it doesn't deliver we're gonna really feel that because we've made the effort to go to a place whereas now we can just open our laptop screen and attend and minimize it if it's no good um but I think these questions of I think because there's been a pause, because the art world's been paused in some ways for a year, I think everyone I know has had to kind of, both artists, institutions, people who, you know, just like art without making it, do they exist? I think they do. Um, and um, why are we doing, like what's good about what we're doing and what's not so good? What can we drop? What can we, what, what should we focus on? Why are we doing this? You know, like, so that's kind of, it, that's very general uh, but for me it's been I'm, I'm quite lucky in that my practice has always been quite a selfish endeavor it's, it's something that I do to understand the world you know it's not something that I've, I've done to kind of make money because my work falls apart not long after I make it and so on and so forth but um but I think that's clearer post-covid like I think we're, we're all a little bit more aware of why we're doing 
things and what we're doing things. And so much of that has been about community. I think um, having our community kind of paused, having like if this was, if I was at the Delaware right now, you know, I'd get some fish and chips, I'd, I'd go to the harp, I'd do whatever, you know, it'd be amazing. Um, make a fool of myself somehow, which would be wonderful. Now I'm just gonna have to make a fool of myself after the talk by myself. But like, um, so I think that's been super important. And I, and I hope that that understanding of what community is will mean that the work that gets made in the future is more generous and more porous and more open to being shared in whatever way that means. Because there's, there's a trillion ways to make that possible. But yeah, again, that's my kind of thoughts on it. That's great, thank you. But yeah, I am from Farnham, hi. <laughs> hey, how's Farnham? Are you there yes. now? Yes, I'm currently in Farnham at the moment. Wow. It's, great. it's a bit strange, under COVID, we haven't had much time to go in. No. Uh, we've done a lot of like sculpture and what have you, and we're actually learning a lot about like creating work that does break down. So like mm. listening to how you practice your work is really like intrinsic and really cool at the moment. So I'm really like fascinated by your talk. Great. Um, That's really good. About how you feel about like the art institutions, how that might change because of COVID. How like what your opinion on that would be, since a lot of us haven't been in studio. Mm. You've been sourcing work, like sourcing material, like dog. Mm. Like you're, you're um, showing that you can create with outside of an institution mm. that we might not need that in the future. What your opinion on that would be? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, like, Rosie, have I got time to answer that? I know it's five. I can answer that. Yeah, we've got a couple of minutes. Cool. Yes. I'll do that as quick away as I can. Um, yes, just like uh, work should not be, you should be able to make work out of anything, obviously. And, 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 in, and yeah, artistic institutions, they've realised they can, they can be more flexible spaces. They've become more accessible. Like, it's disgusting that it took this long, but the fact a global pandemic has made everyone learn that you can have subtitles, that people can turn up to things without having to physically be there. This is, if actually, this is one of my favourite things about the past year is everyone's learned how to kind of use it. I mean, not that I knew before. I, I raised my hand on this as well. Um, and... Yeah, I hope that art schools adapt well. I, I'm scared they won't. I'm scared they'll do the opposite. Uh, and I'm scared a lot of places will do the opposite, but there is an opportunity for them to become more radical spaces and through being more dispersed. But there's always, a, I think with any institution that's built on making money as universities are, unfortunately, these days, um, it's, it's scary, it is scary for sure. Um, so I, I'm hopeful yet. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> A nice, Thank you, a nice uplifting note to end on. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, seriously, the past, the past year has shown for the entire sector, galleries, music venues, everyone involved in the arts, we can kind of take stock and think about, as you said, what we did in the past and how we can change and how we can adapt moving forwards, which I know has been at the forefront of my mind and my colleagues' minds in Delaware over particularly the last six months or so as we start to emerge from the crisis. So yeah, a time for hope and new starts. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up there and I'll just bring Pippa back to say a few final words before we move on to a chat and open discussion between Pippa and I and anyone who wants to hang around. I think you've covered it, Dan, really. I just came back in to say a really big thank you to Rosie and Carl. That was really absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And a big thank you to Holly as well, our BSL interpreter. Um, yeah, and as Dan said, we'll be hanging around for anyone who wants to have a chat with uh, us afterwards, Dan and I. Um, yeah, and we hope to see you soon. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I'm going to slip out, as I think Carl might be as well, but lovely to be here with all of you and um, hope to see you in real life or again on Zoom. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Stephanie. Guys. Thanks so much, everyone. Really wonderful. Bye. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you for spending Bye. a sunny Friday afternoon here. Wow. <laughs>